trim brakes. God, I hate trim brakes. These universally loathed elements garner the scorn of enthusiasts the world over, but they are utterly ubiquitous in roller coasters, both old and new, despite the derision they garner. Nothing can be more maddening. You careen down a long drop with a full head of steam, ready to blast out of your seat on the following ascent, and then you hear it. That distinctive sound that accompanies the seemingly antithetical sensation of slowing down on a roller coaster. Why is this happening? Maybe you have some choice words to spare for that poor 17 year old ride up you just heckled for stapling you after disembarking, but no amount of bitching on online forums with a bunch of like minded neckbeards is going to change a damn thing. Trim brakes are here to stay. But, like, why? And are they even necessary? Let's find out. Before I begin though, I want to start off with a very important distinction. We are not talking about block brakes here, at least necessarily. Block brakes can and often do function as trims, but it's a sort of square rectangle scenario here. All block brakes can function as trims, but not all trims are block brakes. So what is a block brake then? For those of you who are unfamiliar, a block zone is a section of ride that only one train may occupy. At the end of a block zone is a method to stop a train in case the block zone ahead is still occupied. This is the safety system that prevents roller coaster trains from colliding into one another. For this video, the critical element is that last part. At the end of each block zone is a method to stop a train, which can be final brakes, the station, the chain lift, or sometimes a mid-course brake run and often a mid-course wheel trim. But the mid-course block brake has two other essential duties that distinguish it from a standard trim brake. First, the block brake must be able to stop and fit an entire train. And secondly, after a dead stop on the block brake, the roller coaster train must be able to return the station without valeting. These puny little trims you see in the bottom of a B&M airtime hill ain't up to either of those tasks. On certain rides, mid-course brake runs don't even hit they're solely there to help increase capacity and add in an additional factor of safety. So let's salute our mid-course brake runs for their hard work and turn our attention to the real subject of this video, the puny little trim. Ah! Trim brakes have been around since the very early days of roller coasters. Back in the day before computer-generated masterpieces such as Busch Gardens Williamsburg's Drakenfire perfected the art of the roller coaster, coaster design was a far less precise science. Sure, you had some slide rule equations and a piece of coat hanger wire to provide some general guidance, but it was common and expected that roller coasters would have to be modified after their opening, with train modifications, track reprofiles, and if your ride was careening out of control, trim brakes. You going 15 miles an hour too fast because you didn't account for wind resistance correctly? That's fine, let's just add a trim brake and the train will slow down to a more manageable speed. No, 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 that's still too fast. Well, with computers, we can accurately and reliably predict how a ride will behave in all sorts of conditions. So why do trims still litter modern coasters? Especially B&M, who packs trim brakes on their 200 and 300 foot tall behemoths like they're being paid off by Big Brake. Well, there is actually a reason. Roller coasters don't operate in a vacuum, far from it in fact. We can design our perfect little coaster on that industry copy of No Limits 2 that Alan Schilke definitely uses to design all of his rides, but there are a myriad of additional factors that affect how fast a ride goes. Our little computer simulation is only providing a single snapshot at a single design point, and sure, we can model a bunch of different design points, but at the end of the day, it's impossible to account for everything. If you really want to do our homework, here's a brief list of all the things we need to account for while designing a ride. The number of riders on a train, the weight of the riders, the weight distribution of the riders, the condition of the train, the condition of the wheels, the lubrication of the wheels, the lubrication of the track components, the number of cycles that day, the variation in the speed of the chain lift, the variation in the speed of launches, the temperature, the humidity, the wind, air pressure, rain, snow, emergency stops on block brakes, emergency stops on chain lifts, evacs. You get the idea. There's a lot. Let's touch on that first factor briefly, the number of riders in the train. Even Roller Coaster Tycoon got this right 20 years ago. Now take this example, two identical layouts with one major difference. One coaster has a full train and one coaster has an empty train. 
Let's see what happens when they run through the exact same course. Slow! They call you slow! As you can tell, the difference is pretty dramatic. And the reason for this difference is related to momentum, or P equals MV. Basically, the heavier the train is, the M in the equation, the more momentum it carries, and so the better it carries its speed. As I'm sure you know if you've ever had the experience, a full train flies a lot faster than an empty one. The rest of the factors follow similarly, and I won't dive into every single one because I don't want this video to be two hours long, but a lot of these are intuitive. We talk about how a coaster warms up during the day, well, yeah, the wheels in the track physically warm through cycling. Higher temperatures, more energy, more speed. And what about rain? Slippery rails means less friction and slippery speed, and so on and so forth. Now to the math. Here we have a theoretical roller coaster speed graph for a nice short ride. Super simple, we have a drop, a camelback, and a loop, and we're only tracking prime ride time. This is the speed we've designed the ride to go. Now what are the two major extremes? Let's say a full train warmed up at the end of the day, 110 degree weather, fully cycled, freshly lubed the whole nine yards. And on the other end, we have an empty train going for its first cycle in 30 degree weather. These, for the coaster designer, are the two worst case scenarios. I'm sure most of us disagree about the former being a worst case, but we're talking from a design standpoint. With these two hypotheticals, we can establish an upper bound and a lower bound that surround our ride's design speed, and now we've created our operating window. Within these two plots lies the complete performance range of our coaster. Assuming everything is working properly, the coaster should never go faster or slower than this. Now, there are two other major constraints coaster designers have to worry about. The first is G-force limitations. Believe it or not, there is actually an engineering standard set out by ASTM Committee F24. And if you've never heard the words ASTM standard before, welcome to the engineering world. As the standard states, rides cannot sustain more than six positive Gs for more than one second, four Gs for more than four seconds, etc., etc. And there's similar standards for negative Gs and laterals as well. And these all exist to ensure the glorious mistake that is I-305 will never happen again. Seriously though, there is a bit of a factor of safety, but if we exceed these parameters at any point, we could be potentially injuring riders and damaging the roller coaster itself. The second constraint is much simpler, and it's that the coaster needs to just complete the whole damn course without valleying. In engineering terms, that means our speed can never drop below zero miles per hour, even at its slowest, and if engineers fail to meet this objective, there can be disastrous consequences. Oh, don't worry about the hours long evacuation, that's the easy part. Now the park has to either physically winch the train back to the station or disassemble the train bit by bit to be carried out by crane, a process that can take weeks. Weeks where the ride will be unable to run. That's a big problem. Above all, it's the designer's job to produce a coaster that thrills riders, but also does so in a way that meets the very concrete force requirements and doesn't valley constantly. And here's the million dollar question though. How hard can it be? The answer is actually pretty hard. Let's overlay some force restrictions and minimum speed constraints in our graph now, and uh-oh, it seems that our design is not going to work. On a hot summer's day, our ride's going to blast past the ASTM G-force restrictions in that final loop. And on a cold day, it's just not going to finish the course. I tend to exaggerate things for the sake of explanation in these videos, but this time around, there's no hyperbole needed. There can be significant variation in a ride's speed, especially when there aren't trims involved. Now take this example from El Toro Orion and his brilliant discussion of the disastrous Rattler at Six Flags Fiesta, Texas. The ride was ideally supposed to take 95 to 100 seconds from when it dropped off the lift hill to when it hit the final brake run. But trains could travel as fast as 84 to 88 seconds or as slow as over 110 seconds. That is a spread of almost 30 seconds on a ride that takes less than two minutes to complete even at its slowest. And if you know anything about the Rattler, you know that this variation led to some unintended consequences. How do we control this variation then? Well, the solution's obvious, isn't it? Trim brakes! This was the obvious solution even all the way back in the ancient history of the 1990s. With trims, we can slow down a train to a certain speed every time and minimize the variation that trimless rides are forced to deal with. The Son of Beast has that famous trim brake before the loop that was set up by computer to ensure the ride would always hit the loop at exactly 62 miles an hour, for example. Seems that RCCA learned their lesson. 
Beforehand, our rides were quite literally careening out of control, but now we can make the ride behave how we want it. Old school trims and fixed magnetic trims, such as the ones found and hated on some Intamins, are generally more of the on-off variety with little finesse involved, but more modern designs can adjust train speeds on the fly to ensure clinical consistency. So let's add a trim to our fake coaster now and see what happens. We'll start off without changing the design, just adding a trim on the first Camelback that slows down the train by 7 miles an hour. Immediately we can see that we're meeting our goals now on the high end. Great news! We're not violating strict industry standards and probably not hurting our riders. Oh, but we found another unintended consequence. Our standard ride is moving slower than we wanted, and even if we don't operate the trims in bad conditions, our slowest possible ride is still going to valley. Now how do we fix that? And this requires going back to the drawing board for a bit. To get a more consistent ride experience, we're going to purposefully design the ride to run fast and keep the trims on almost constantly. Now the original design is our cold run lower bound and the top, our original fast ride, is our standard ride with the trim brake guaranteed to hit. Now for running faster, just trim harder. That's how many modern rides, especially long ones like B&M Hypers, are designed. The result, for the 90% of the time when the coaster is operating in average-ish conditions, you know, a half full train, an 80 degree day, maybe a full train and a bit of a cold spell or vice versa, the trims are always going to hit. And the result is a guaranteed buzzkill. The buzzkill only gets worse as the ride speeds up and trim brakes can absolutely clamp down trains in hotter weather, slowing them to a crawl. More importantly though, the worst case scenario cold ride, now running completely trimless, runs a good bit faster, and valley risk is virtually eliminated. This design philosophy can lead to some pretty funny experiences where rides end up tearing through their back halves way faster than normal in super cold weather. I've experienced this phenomenon with Nitro and Steel Force a few times, but the best ride I ever got at Dominator at King's Dominion was on a nearly empty train in 50 degree foggy weather. The trims were completely off and the back half was absolutely savage. Well, now we've done it. We've built a modern roller coaster. Look around at modern designs, especially longer ones, and it's not hard to see this design philosophy in action. Smaller and shorter rides sometimes get away without trims, but it's rare for a modern day Hyper or Giga to come without some form of brake. Now B&M is perhaps the biggest offender in the industry, littering micro trims across the track in multiple spots in some of their lengthiest rides. I need not tell you about Intimidator at Carowinds, the mere mention of the name generates scorn from Thuzies. And that said, I can see the philosophy behind B&M's micro trim style. Instead of having one big trim at the mid course that really saps the ride in momentum, a bunch of small trims makes the speed loss less noticeable, makes the ride extremely consistent on an element to element basis. Now if only the trims in our Intimidator actually operated this way. Still, a few proud newcomers soldier on, unshackled by the oppression of trim brakes. Iron Gwazi runs trimless, but it slows down so much at the top of the lift and so painfully, and I would take a harsh mid-course over that gimped first drop any day. Millie, El Toro, Lightning Rod, Sky Rush, Hakuge, do you see a theme here? Are all longish coasters that live in the modern world without a trim. But if you ask someone about these rides, you usually hear a pretty common refrain. Oh, don't ride it early, it has to warm up. And why does it have to warm up? because the variation in speed is so great. It can suck to feel like you missed out on a true best ride experience if you showed up on a cold day, or maybe the park just wasn't crowded enough to fill up the trains consistently. When all the ingredients come together and you do get that perfect ride, a long, trimless coaster is absolute magic. Oh my god! So, in conclusion, do roller coasters really need trims? Hell no! I know I speak for most enthusiasts when I say that I want my trimless rides and dangerous forces in the glory of hot weather and full trains. Most of the time engineers build in a factor of safety anyway, so it's very rare that a full bore trimless run would push any ride into truly dangerous territory. Trims are there for caution, but more importantly for maintenance. It's pretty sensible to intuit that faster trains are going to put more wear on both themselves and the track. If a slower ride is going to save having to buy a few hundred wheels over the course of a year, then yeah, of course a park is going to hit the trims. But I say screw it. If Holiday World can run the Voyage trimless for a bunch of neckbeards once a year, they could do it every single day, damn the added maintenance cost. 
And that said, I know my ranting will be utterly fruitless, but I hope you now understand just why your favorite hypercoaster has that horrible buzzkill in the middle of its best airtime hill. Looking at you, Diamondback. <laughs>